Thank you. Can everybody hear me with this mic? Can everybody hear me? Is this mic? Do you know how to increase the volume? They don't. Talk louder. Talk louder. Is this it? Do you know how to? Oh, it's on the, okay, excellent. So, uh, that's a little too loud. Okay, that's good. That's great. Uh, I'm Matthew Lalonde. Uh, just to you know, clarify things, I have a PhD in organic chemistry from this university. Also got my postdoc in inorganic chemistry from this university. I'm currently uh, staff. I'm responsible for training and teaching. But I am not faculty, and I do not have a research group. So whether or not that makes me qualified to speak on the subject of nutrition is for you to decide. Uh, I often get the question, why should I avoid grains and legumes? And I purposefully left dairy out of the equation. And whenever I, I ask that, uh, I'm asked that question, I will typically use these four things. I'll say, well, there's the immun immunogenic and allergenic uh, properties of proteins that are found in uh, grains and legumes. There's unsustainable grain agriculture. It's not clear whether or not legume agriculture is sustainable. Then there's the whole theory of food palatability and reward. Uh, which is championed by uh, Stéphane Guinet. Uh, I hope that most of you know his work. And then there's nutrient density. And what I like about these four things is that when you present that to someone, you have a choice. You can either address it from an evolutionary angle, or you can address it from a very simple, maybe biology, psychology angle, specifically with these two things here. Uh, actually, sorry, these two things here. And the reason I say that is not because I don't believe in evolution. I personally am a strong believer in evolution. But it's because 40% of Americans believe that evolution is false, and 20% of Americans are still undecided on the issue. And officially, only 40% uh, of Americans think that evolution is true. We are ranked uh, you know, second to last. Turkey is a little bit worse than we are. So <laughs> this is a very unfortunate reality for our community, and this is why I, I prefer to address the issue in this manner. My talk, as the title implied, is going to focus on nutrient density, and whenever someone asks me about nutrient density, I give them this great paper by Professor Cordain uh, and Boyd Eaton, who's sitting right here, uh, where they, and this is a table that's in the paper, and they analyzed uh, a variety of food groups uh, based on these nutrients, and then they classified them, and you can tell Based on their analysis, vegetables have a pretty high score, seafood, lean meat, and then fruits. So a diet of you know, vegetables, seafood, lean meats, and fruits is going to give you everything that you need. However, we have a really intelligent and I would say critical community. And when I send this to people, I will get one of the three criticisms back. One of them is that they say, well, we don't have the software that was used to calculate this, so we can't verify the scores. We don't know how they came up with this. We can't check it. Like, okay, fair enough. Uh, two, the legumes are not there. There's no legumes group. So how do you justify not eating the legumes? And three is that the number of foods per category is fairly small. So whole milk, there's just one. Uh, in lean meat, there's just four. Nuts and seeds, there's just 10. Whole grains, there's just eight. That kind of stuff. So I'm like. Okay, you know, I guess, I guess you have a point. So I, after I got these criticisms back, I said, I, I'll look for something else. You know, I'm pretty sure that this is good work, but I'll look for something else. So I, I started looking for other papers, and I found uh, this work here uh, by Drunowski. Uh, and this is essentially a model that he came up with. He's using model NR9 here. So he essentially takes what he calls desirable macronutrients, and uh, vitamins and minerals, so protein and fiber, vitamins A, C, and E, calcium, uh, iron, magnesium, and potassium. And then he counteracts that with undesirable nutrients, saturated fat, added sugar, and sodium. And he, yeah, I know. Uh, and, <laughs> and, he comes up, and he comes up with a score. And of course, the saturated fat issue is just, we should not have to address this anymore. This is a summary of the great fat debate where you know, a lot of great minds in the subject of nutrition came together. This is what Dariush Motsafarian from this university wrote after that conference. He says, although the paradigm that saturated fat is a major cause of coronary heart disease has been, uh, become entrenched in the public scientific consciousness over decades, modern nutritional evidence simply does not support a major effect of saturated fat on coronary heart disease risk. 
These scientific advances include the randomized trials of disease outcomes, the prospective cohort studies of disease outcomes, and randomized trials of multiple, not just single biomarkers and risk factors. Enough said. So, thank you. <laughs> so, back to this model, the person uh, also, you know, uses food categories as opposed to individual foods, ranks fruits and vegetables fairly high. So here we have the caloric density and then here we have the rating. Uh, and this is how it was calculated, if you're interested in exactly how we calculated this. You have uh, milk products here. Uh, you have meat, poultry, and fish over here, grains over here, fats and oils. And it's interesting, there's not like a whole lot of difference here except for the caloric density. And then you have dry beans here. But this is based off you know, you know, five nutrients. I'm like, ah, I'd, like, I'd like a little bit more. And I feel like I can't, I can't uh, give this to folks. So I hit up my, fav my favorite uh, paleo registered dietitian, that's Amy Kubel, who's here at the conference. And I said, hey, Amy, what do you use? So she points me in the direction of Nuval. And this is pretty interesting. It's a ranking system, goes from zero to 100, and it gives a score to a food. And uh, I think that the uh, grocery chain, uh, the chain Hy-Vee uses these things. So you look at the scores, and you're like, ah, spinach, 82, sure, avocados, 89, broccoli, 100. Yeah, OK, you know, I buy that. Uh, pineapple, 99, hmm. Sardines, 88, OK, sardine, lobster, 36. Oh, well, that's a head scratcher. <laughs> and then. And then you keep going down the list, and you get the chicken breast 39, shrimp 75, ham 27, pork baby back ribs 24, and, and all the meat gets a rotten score, and you start asking yourself, how was this calculated? <laughs> well, here's how it was calculated. In the numerator, they have a bunch of what they feel is good stuff, which I agree for the most part, iron, vitamin A, C, D, E, zinc, magnesium, omega-3 fat, fatty acids, total carotenoids, potassium, folate, calcium, total bioflavonoids, which doesn't belong there in my opinion, but I'll get to that. And then in the denominator, they have trans fat, cholesterol, saturated fat, sodium, and sugar. Well, we've already addressed the saturated fat, but then cholesterol, really? The sugar, maybe, but sodium, yeah, maybe added sodium. But the cholesterol, I mean, the man that came up with the hypothesis, Ansel Keys, in 1953, wrote in one of his own articles that the dietary cholesterol is not important for man would be predicted from the fact that the biliary output of cholesterol from the human liver is from 10 to 20 times as much as the daily amount of cholesterol in any diet of natural foods. Repeated carefully, uh, careful dietary surveys on large numbers of persons in whom blood cholesterol was measured consistently failed to disclose a relationship between the cholesterol in the diet and in the serum. This has been reviewed more recently, two reviews by the same author, where they have shows that, that there is actually a group of hyperresponders. In that group of hyperresponders, both LDL and HDL increase, so the LDL to HDL uh, ratio doesn't change. And, however, the dietary cholesterol does reduce circulating levels of small, dense uh, lipoprotein particles that are thought to be a risk factor for coronary heart disease. So again, maybe we should not be uh, thinking that this is a bad thing. So I keep surfing on the new Val site, and eventually I reach their board of directors. Dr. David Katz, David Jenkins, Walter Willett, and a variety of other folks who are known proponents of plant diets. Does this sound like a biased system to you? It sounds like it. it sounds like one to me. So I kept searching, and that's when I met Andy. Andy is the Aggregate Nutrient Density Index. This you will find on signs in uh, Whole Foods grocery stores. This score goes from zero to 1,000, and you can tell things like kale and collards get 1,000, and then if you look for meat anywhere on the list, you're going to have to make it all the way down over here to chicken breast 27. Really, 27 out of 1,000? Ground beef, 20? 20 out of 1,000? Really? Are you serious? So I actually don't, I didn't need to search very far. I looked for a critique of this, uh, of this, uh, this system, and Chris Masterjohn has done an excellent job of doing that. So I'm just going to summarize what Chris came up with. So this is Chris Masterjohn down here in the corner. You could say a proponent of you know, grain legume-free diets, if you will and then uh, works, for the, the, uh, works with the Weston A. Price Foundation. And then here we have Joel Furlman, the, creation of, uh, the, creation, the guy that created Andy, who is a known proponent of plant-based diets. So he excludes from his calculations preformed vitamin A, vitamin B5, vitamin B12, vitamin D, uh, biotin, vitamin K1 and K2, taurine and iodine. He, uh, he uh, also excludes essential minerals, sodium, chloride, potassium, sulfur, phosphorus, copper, manganese, boron, molybdenum, and chromium, all essential fatty acids and essential amino acids. <laughs> What he includes in the score are carotenes and other pigments, glucosinolates, which do have problems, 
uh, in themselves as far as biological activity is concerned. Uh, fiber and the oxygen, ra the oxygen radical absorbance capacity, what we call the ORAC, times two, because he thinks it's so important. Most of these compounds, I'll tell you honestly from a chemist standpoint, we don't even know how they work or why they're so important. So at that point, I got really fed up with this stuff and I said, all right, I'm gonna make my own. <laughs> so we're gonna start. Thank you. We're gonna start by defining nutrient density. Well, from a purely scientific standpoint, density is a quantity of stuff divided by volume. And that quantity of stuff, in order to avoid the biases that we've just seen, we are going to limit to essential nutrients per serving. That's it, you can't go outside of that category because then you're gonna start including a bunch of stuff that's favoring this food and that food, don't want it. It's essential nutrients, that's all we're gonna focus on. What are your essential nutrients? Fatty acids, the accepted ones are ALA and LA. Unfortunately, that should be DHA and AA, but that's not the case. I'm not gonna get into why. Amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, valine, and histidine. Uh, histidine is like plus or minus, it depends. Vitamins, A, B, P, which is choline, B1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, which is also called biotin or vitamin H, B9, which is folate, B12, C, D, E, and K, and then your minerals, you have calcium, chloride, chromium, cobalt, copper, iodide, iron, magnesium, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, phosphorus, potassium, selenium, sodium, sulfur, and zinc. Excellent. The problem is that you can't find data on volume of food. It's typically not measured. You can find data on calories per serving. Using this, this definition, I started processing data and I found two problems. One, zero, zero calorie foods can be treated. Electrolyte enhanced water, for example, has some advantages, you can't treat it, zero, right? Because you're dividing by zero. And if you think about this carefully, this confuses or combines nutrient density and caloric density. If you have a food that's very nutrient dense, but also calorically dense, it's not gonna get as good of a score as a food that has the same nutrient density, but fewer calories. And in my opinion, those things are separate. They should be considered separately. If you have someone who needs to lose weight, well sure, stay on you know, moderate to high nutrient density, but then moderate to low caloric density. You've got an athlete, hey, you know, there's only so much food you can eat. So increase the caloric density of the food that you're eating. Those two things should be considered separately. Uh, so I decided finally to use the weight per serving, which always comes with the food. Uh, the only problem here is that this is no longer a density. We're still gonna call it a density, but it's actually a, concentra a concentration, scientifically speaking. So now where do we get the data? Well, it turns out that uh, the USDA has this huge amount of data available with the uh, type of nutrients that are in foods. I had two choices here. I could use the access version which is the full version, or I could use the Excel version, which is an abbreviated version. And my goal was to distribute this to anyone who wanted it. And unfortunately, not too many people know how to use access or have access. So I decided to go with the Excel version. What's missing from the Excel version that I wish I had? A distinction between vitamin D, D2 and D3. Right now in the Excel version, they're, they're taken together. And then uh, the individual fatty acids and the individual amino acids would have been nice because then I could have added those there. So, on, from the wish list, what can we not have? Well, we don't have the fatty acids, we don't have the amino acids, which is too bad. We have almost all of the vitamins except for B7 and a variety of minerals except for chloride, chromium, cobalt, iodide, molybdenum, nickel, and sulfur. Of the data that was available to me from that spreadsheet that I did not use because it was not an essential nutrient, sodium. And the reason I left out sodium and I would have had to leave out chloride too, uh, is because it favors, if you incorporate it, it favors food that have a lot of added salt. And you, you can't do that, so you have to leave it out of the equation. You, know, you got no choice. Left out fiber, I'm sorry food, I'm, uh, you know, it's not essential. I know I'm gonna get a lot of flack for that, but it's not essential. I will correct for that a little bit later on, you'll see, but fiber is not considered essential, so I left it out. Then there's uh, all of these uh, substances that you know, would favor very specific foods, and then this stuff is mostly for the caloric content, so that was completely left out. So now, you got a spreadsheet, you've got your minerals and vitamins and choline too. Uh, all of these have very, very different standard deviations. So you have no choice but to standardize the data. So you, if you look at the standard deviation for calcium, it's 214, that for iron is six. You, you can't compare those things. And then some are in milligrams, some are in micrograms. So you need a quantity that's unisless and that's standardized. So what you do is that you take the unit, you subtract the, the, the mean, of the group and then you divide it by the standard deviation and that gives you a standardized number. Those numbers go from negative to positive. 
After doing that, for each food, uh, and it's not that I'm favoring dairy here, it's just this is the top of the, uh, of the spreadsheet. For each food, I just add up the score across all nutrients, and that is what I call the nutrient density of that food. I could have divided by 100, but they're, all, they're over uh, 100 grams, all of them, so I just left it as is. So that's the nutrient density score. With that is coupled the caloric density that you have. All of these are for 100 gram samples. So now we've got a little bit of data. Uh, actually, we have 7,907 entries in that spreadsheet in foods, and they had to be separated into 46 different categories, one line item at a time. This took about three days with minimal sleep and food, and I never want to go through that again. So if someone wants to see a different result from this, I'm just gonna send you the spreadsheet and say, you go, tiger, because I'm not doing this anymore. I obviously do not have the time to focus on all of these things. Some of the, why I separated some of the things uh, hopefully will make sense to you. So uh, cooked grains, for example, and pseudocereals are separated from raw grains and pseudocereals. You can't eat raw wheat berry or a raw chickpea or stuff like that. You, so you can't, you have to put that in a separate section, right? Uh, in the grains section, I only kept the whole grains. So I separated processed foods from whole foods only whole grains. So the breads, pastas, and noodles are in a different section. The baked goods are in a different section. The enriched grains are in a different section. Just so I'm, you know, I'm trying to compare things in as fair a manner as possible. So these are the things that I'm going to be focused on here. Uh, so in the eggs and dairy section, the high scores, I'm going to ignore the dried stuff. And the dried stuff is because it's, it's obviously it's concentrated, right? And it's typically not something that you eat. So I, I'm going to focus on things like egg yolks, raw and fresh. You can tell that the egg yolks are pretty, uh, they're pretty nutrient dense. The scores go up to 49. Some of the scores can go near 100. If it's an enriched food, it can go uh, past 100. And then for the minus, it'll, it typically doesn't go past minus 10. Uh, and the, so you see the eggs and cheese are pretty much what is most nutritious at the top of this category. If you want to plot that now, what is far more useful than having a score, let's say you've got spinach at 99 and you've got kale at 99. Well, that's great. What's the difference? You know, it's, are, do they have exactly the same amount of nutrients? You can't tell. So you can plot this stuff, and uh, that's what I did here. The numbers on the left are how many times the RDA do you have? So I took the quantities, the milligrams, the micrograms, divided them by the RDA, and that's what you see here. So this red bar goes above one. That means that Parmesan cheese shredded at 100 gram serving has more than one times the RDA per calcium. You can tell that the eggs and dairy have a pretty nice distribution of vitamins overall. Even the least nutritious one of this group, which is still at the top, which is the duck egg, so it's still fairly nutritious. We're looking at a score of 4.73. And then here you have the caloric density. So this is the nutrient density. This is the caloric density. Uh, and then you can see that the eggs have choline in them, but the cheese doesn't have choline. The cheese has a bit of fat-soluble vitamins, actually, so, this, so do the eggs. And you can mix and match, make things very interesting. If you wanted to put this on a label, you could minimize this whole thing into a spark line. This, these spark lines were created by Edward Tufte. What I actually wanted was just a line. So imagine a line tracing the contour of this thing, such that you can overlay them and tell very uh, quickly what's what. And all you need is one dot telling you, okay, this is 1.49 times the RDA, so I know more or less what this is. Nutrient density, caloric density, good to go, bam. You have that on a label. You can miniaturize that. It's very easy. You get a lot of information very quickly. On the low scores in the eggs and dairy, you know, you can tell we're in the minuses now. It goes as, uh, as low as minus seven. I was surprised to find human milk. <laughs> However, it's difficult to compare it to other milks because most of the milks were fortified, and I had to put them in a separate category, okay? Uh, there's also some, some craft processed dairy here, things like yogurt, some cottage cheese and stuff like that. What does that look when it's, um, when it's craft? Well, you can tell we're already below one. Uh, this uh, food here, butter, has just a lot of salt and vitamin A and not much of anything else, although it does have some vitamin D, E, and K as well. Uh, the human milk has a good distribution, but it's kind of low. And then the best one here that I picked was that cottage cheese, which has a, a decent distribution, but also low in some of the vitamins. So this is you know, very interesting stuff to look at. Uh, I thought that the audience would be interested, especially this audience, in a comparison between egg yolks and egg whites. I'm sorry, but for those of you eating egg white omelets, I'll take the yolks. <laughs> Just, don't throw them away, because I'll take them. All right. <laughs> The egg yolk crushes the egg white on every category, <laughs> safe for sodium. 
I think. Yeah. So very interesting. Let's go to herbs and spices. Herbs and spices are a winner. The highest one, dried basil, is up to 76. Then you've got things like thyme and parsley and sage and spearmint. And you can go down the list until you reach things like distilled vinegar, vanilla, table salt, more vinegar, more vanilla, uh, more vanilla and then this Campbell's Soup Company dry taco <laughs> season mix, uh, which are not very nutritious. So instead of giving you a high and low, this time I'm gonna give you just a sample of the data from something that's very nutritious, like the basil. You can tell basil has a lot of vitamin K, even a little bit of choline, which was surprising, some vitamin E, a decent distribution, uh, a lot of, uh, of minerals. And then you look at things like pepper, huh, interesting distribution across the board, maybe a, a little heavy on the mineral side of thing. Salt is, of course, just sodium. If uh, we had access to iodine, uh, then maybe we could see that in there, but it looks like uh, there's no potassium. I thought there would be potassium there, but salt doesn't have much to offer, really. Nuts and seeds, high scores there, 71, also very, very nutritious. You know, you've got things like Brazil nuts, cotton seeds, sunflower, going down the mix, sesame, pumpkin seeds, that kind of stuff. At the bottom of the category, you're gonna have chestnuts and more chestnuts and ginkgo nuts, that kind of acorns, that kind of stuff, breadfruit seeds. Here's a sampling of the data, again, from something very nutritious to something less nutritious. Brazil nuts, this is cut off the chart because I needed to see the rest of it. Brazil nuts has thir have 34.85 times the RDA in selenium. So when I graphed this, all I could see was a big blue bar. So I had to shrink it down a little bit. Uh, again, a decent distribution in the nuts, although like a, a, I expected a little bit more on this side of things. There is some vitamin D, uh, but I expected a little bit more on this side of things and, and not quite so hot. So mostly on the mineral side for, uh, for the nuts, but still fairly, uh, fairly nutritious in general, uh, except maybe for those, uh, for those chestnuts. Fruit, high scores about uh, 19, but then you're looking at dried stuff. So if you look at something not dried, you have to go to this West Indian cherry here. Okay, that's pretty good. Then there's a lot of more dried stuff, and then you get to Logan's and avocados. You know, it is a fruit, dates, uh, raisins, that kind of stuff, oranges. Coconut meat is there, by the way. And uh, I think I've got that graph. The losers in the fruit category are apples, and uh, a lot of varieties of apples. Pears, crab apples, uh, watermelon, that kind of stuff is what's at the bottom. What does this look uh, when you graph it? Here is, uh, here's that West uh, Indian, Indian cherry. Uh, that's mostly vitamin C, actually has 18.64 times the vitamin C, so that's another one that I had to chop off to see what the heck was going on. Fairly good distribution of vitamins uh, in the fruit. Uh, not too surprisingly, not a whole lot of fat-soluble vitamins. That's okay, maybe you'd get that if, you, if I'd put avocados on there. I did put the, the coconut, and even the coconut is mostly on the uh, on the left side of the graph, but there's a little bit of choline and a little bit of vitamin E in there. But you can tell how this is fairly informative and you can see how the nutrient density goes down uh, as it should as the scores go down. Uh, here we're going from 1687 to minus, uh, minus 8.45. Edible, raw, and unprepared vegetables. I separated the raw vegetables, those that are edible raw. So I, raw potatoes are in a different category. They're not edible raw. I mean, you can eat them, but it's just not great for you. So I put that in a different category. Uh, so here are the edible raw vegetables. At the top of the stuff that's not dry, you keep going down and you're eventually gonna get to kale. All of the greens, uh, greens kale, dandelion, chard, all that stuff have, very, uh, have high positive scores. If you want to go to the bottom, you're gonna find onions and cucumbers and, and pickles and relishes and radishes and that kind of stuff. Uh, what does that look like when it's, uh, hey, that might be a mistake, oh no. Taro, taro shoots, can you eat those raw? I don't know. Anyways, uh, that's what, uh, here's what it looks like when it's graphed. So here we have kale. Kale has 6.8 times the RDA in vitamin K, so I had to chop that one off. Very high. Uh, so is lettuce, actually, fairly high in vitamin K. Uh, kale is also high in vitamin C and has a fairly good distribution, maybe a, bit, uh, a little bit low on the selenium and sodium and zinc, but we don't care uh, too much about the, the sodium at this point. It's hard to, you know, to not get enough sodium these days. Uh, on, the, on the purple side of this thing, the seaweed, again, has a very nice distribution across the board uh, and fairly nutritious. But then you get to things like carrots and onions and, and not so much. The onions have a decent distribution, but it's, it's fairly low, so not uh, a whole lot there. 
What you need to look at, however, is the caloric density too, right? So yeah, the kale is good, it's at 50, the onions have a little bit less caloric density. The worst case scenario is if you have something that has got really low nutrient density and really high caloric density. That's something that you wanna stay away of. I'm unfortunately not gonna present much of those foods. Uh, I did calculate all the data, segregated it, and looked at it, and it looks horrible as you would expect, so I'm just not gonna present that. Uh, in the cooked vegetables, the high scores are, again, all of your kale, beet, beet greens, spinach, all of the collard greens, all that stuff, lamb quarters, dandelions, uh, all the grape leaves. And then at the bottom, you again have some onions, and I think here you have like some pickled, and, and this is like cooked and pickled, uh, some jicama, uh, and some onions, cabbage, that kind of stuff. What does it look like? Uh, actually, instead of giving you a spread for this one, you can tell the scores are fairly negative. I decided just to compare some, some cooked and some raw stuff so that you could see how much nutrient uh, loss that you get from cooking. So these are blanched. This is blanched kale versus raw kale. The red is raw kale. So you can tell that across the, bo the board you have lost some nutrition here. However, the cooked kale does have less caloric density. Part of the nutrition loss is due to the fact that some of it really came out of the food and is lost. Another part is the fact that that food is absorbing water when you blanch it and it's diluting the nutrient content. Okay, so it, it looks a little bit worse than it actually is. I also thought that people would be interested in comparison of sweet potatoes versus potatoes. The sweet potatoes are in blue, the potatoes are in red. The potato has a nutrient score of minus 0.13. The sweet potato has a nutrient density score of minus 3.02, so the potato actually wins, and it wins on the mineral side of things. Uh, the sweet potato does win on vitamin A. Uh, the potato does have a much greater new, uh, caloric density, however, uh, almost more than twice of the sweet potato. So you know, if you decided to eat twice as much sweet potato, you'll get close to the levels of minerals like uh, copper and iron that are in the potato. Both of them are fairly nutritious. I mean, if you look at that, you get a pretty decent distribution of nutrients across the board here, uh, even though the scores are negative. So even if a score is negative, doesn't mean the food is necessarily that bad, because uh, not that many of them are, are very high and positive. So now we reach cooked grains uh, and pseudo cereals. This is all we have access to because the rest of it is all raw, and it was put in a different category. So this is all we can look at. Uh, there is no data for cooked wheat. It's not in there, so I couldn't present that. Notice that we begin at the top with negative scores. And I decided to not cover succotash. So if a food was a combined food, so for example, succotash, then I put that in both the grain and the legume category, because it's corn and beans. Uh, so the things, the winners here are like things like kamut, teff, quinoa, and spelt, and the losers, white rice at the bottom. The best rice is this white rice that has long grain. Actually, it's the wild rice, but of the white rice, it's this one with long grain. So what does that look like? So notice that we immediately start below one. Uh, this blue thing here is the kamut. Kamut's not bad, pretty uh, abysmal in this area, but not bad in this area. And then this uh, blue line here, that's the couscous, fairly rich in selenium however, uh, but uh, a little bit, uh, pretty low on, on the rest of the scale. This is cooked versus raw grains. Now, we have teff that is cooked, kamut that is cooked versus kamut that is uncooked, and teff that is uncooked. So the purple should be compared to the blue at the front, and you can see the nutrient loss across the board, right? And then the green should be compared to the red. And again, you can see the nutrient loss across the board, except for an increase in folate that was interesting. Maybe it becomes more bioavailable or, or whatnot. Um, and that's you know, one thing that you need to keep in mind is that this is not corrected for bioavailability. Ideally, you would want that correction uh, in your system. Uh, but I, I don't have those numbers. So there is a, a substantial nutrient loss there, uh, and there's a substantial drop in the score. TEF is 8.16. Cooked TEF is minus 4.67. Kamet is 5.86. Cooked Kamet is minus 4.42. Which one should we be considering, the cooked or the raw? The, the cooked, right? You can't eat the raw stuff. You absolutely can't eat the raw stuff. Same is true for legumes, but there are some legumes that are edible in their raw state. So here I had to uh, create a category for edible raw and cooked legumes, and then another one for inedible raw legumes. Uh, here again, you know, we uh, immediately start with scores. Actually, these are not negative, these are positive. And legumes are far more nutritious than the grains. 
At the top, you have roasted soybeans, and I'll show you, they're, they're fairly nutritious. <laughs> then you have cashews. Yes, I'm sorry, cashew is actually a legume, uh, not a nut. Then you have peanuts uh, and a variety of other foods. I think peanuts pretty much rule this whole thing. At the bottom, you've got things like snap peans, mung beans, uh, other types of beans that are at the, at the bottom. What does this look like when it's plotted? Uh, like I said, the, the soybeans are pretty nutritious. Now, whether or not that's bioavailable, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the purple stuff is the chickpea, and that is the cooked, cheek, the cooked chickpea. Uh, decent distribution here. The, the values are uh, reasonably high, too. Then we go to kidney beans, uh, snap beans, and then finally the, the uh, pinto beans that uh, have a decent distribution, but a little bit low on the scale. Certainly much better than the grains, however. Here is a cooked chickpea versus a raw chickpea, and you can tell that there's a substantial loss of uh, nutrients as you cook this substance. But again, you know, the, the cooked material contains a little bit more water, so some of it is a loss, some of it's a dilution effect. Uh, now we go into the meats, and uh, how, many, how much time do I have left? Excellent. Uh, for those of you, and I had to ask, because for those of you that are pleased with the rankings, you have 10 seconds and no more to celebrate. I have to go on with the talk. There's a lot of data. And I'll give you a hint. <laughs> bacon, 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 and more bacon, <laughs> followed by some loin. However, don't celebrate too quickly. At the bottom, you'll have things like pickled pork hocks, uh, you know, some patties and stuff like that. But you have raw bacon. Well, that's interesting. What's that doing there? You see, I didn't think it would be necessary to separate raw meat from cooked meat. But it turns out that animal fats has an average score of minus 6.85, which is abysmal and that bacon grease finds itself very low on the list. These are all the animal fats, and this is where bacon grease is at. So when you cook your bacon and you get rid of the grease, you actually increase its nutrient density score. I was expecting a nightshade thrown my way as soon as I said that. <laughs> also known as a tomato. So here's some sample data for the pork. We have the cured bacon here uh, in the back. You can tell that this is you know, fairly nutritious stuff. It's got a decent uh, amount of nutrients and a, a good distribution. The same is true for all the other meats, even the, one that, the, the, the ones that aren't that great. Good distribution, but this is low. Uh, however, just as uh, good as one of the low entries in the legume category, for example. In the poultry, the, the winners are things like you know, emu, ostrich, and, and all dove, and all that kind of stuff. And at the bottom, you're gonna have some duck, uh, some mechanically deboned, chickens, some Cornish hen, and other chicken broilers and stuff like that. Um, here's what that looks like. Again, uh, fairly nutritious, so one of the best ones is the, is the emu. Uh, one of the least nutritious here is the duck, and you can tell the, the duck has got some, some serious nutrient deficiencies here. Uh, I'm not sure what they did to it. If you look at the name, it's like duck and then Y-N-G, I'm not sure what that means, D-O-M with pecking duck. Yeah, young duck, that's right. Uh, pecking, leg meat, bone in. I'm like, why is that so poorly nutritious? I don't know. But the rest of the, no, no, actually the skin is really bad. I put that in a, in a separate category. Animal skin is not very, you'll see shortly. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's because it's so high in fat. But actually, I mean, you would expect that to, it would increase if you cooked it, it was, because it wasn't raw. I didn't use any raw stuff. Yeah, it was cooked. Um, so you would expect that to be, to increase the nutrient density as you cooked it, so I don't think that's the case. Beef, and in, in the beef you've got a lot of like uh, steaks, boneless steaks, all that stuff. They call this bean plate, uh, beef plate, and then they give a, a variety of cuts. All of them fairly nutritious. At the bottom you have a lot of ribs, beef ribs and rib eyes that aren't uh, that great. The scores don't go, like notice that the, the lowest score, this is where the grains started at in their high score for beef just to give you uh, an example. Okay, this is what it looks like when graphed. Pretty sexy, right? I mean, this is, this is the lowest one here, right? Not too bad. I mean, you're looking at stuff that's fairly uh, nutritious, has a decent distribution. They, what was that? Yes, exactly, right. You, you can tell why uh, the people who have a vegetarian agenda, they, top, they drop B12 from, uh, from their list because uh, this beef plate that's at the top has 3.14 times the RDA, so I had to cut it off in B12. 
Uh, efficient seafood, oysters and clams uh, and that kind of stuff, octopus, uh, they're all at the top. And then at the bottom, you've got some jellyfish, some dried jellyfish and, and a variety of, of other processed things that aren't too interesting. If you, uh, if you plot that, uh, the oysters are just a powerhouse of nutrition, so I had to cut that off. Uh, they have 6.34 times the RDA in copper, 7.15 times the RDA in zinc, and 7.29 times, times the RDA in B12, uh, with a decent distribution of uh, minerals overall. The fact that these are so tall made these look really small, but this is pretty nutritious stuff. So is salmon, uh, so is the tilapia, but then the jellyfish is, is pretty abysmal. You know, it's got sodium and selenium, uh, copper and iron, and not much of anything else. It does have some choline, though, which is fairly interesting. It was nice to see where choline popped up. Then we've got lamb, veal, and game meat. So the high scores here, we've got things like game meat, caribou, deer, beaver, raccoon. But then it's interesting that the game meat is also at the bottom. You've got things like uh, boar, you've got squirrel, rabbit, mm, squirrel, muskrat, mm, yum. Um, and then the, the veal and the lamb is sort of in between. Notice again, you know, the, as you're going down, you're, you're at minus four here, and then there's like only a few entries that are below that. So this is still fairly nutritious stuff. Uh, here's uh, that plotted out. Uh, I took like the, the elk here as one of my examples because it was cooked. Notice you know, that the raw meat often finds its way at the bottom. So I did my best to pick something that was cooked to graph. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have to separate the raw meat from the cooked meat. Right? I have no choice uh, because it, it's obviously a confounder. So the elk uh, isn't all that, uh, that great, but it's still decent. Uh, and then you have things like uh, veal breast that's good, uh, the lamb shoulder blade, uh, and then the, the meat boar that's, uh, that's pretty good. Again, good distribution and decent amount of nutrients all overall. The organ meats, this is one of the highest score for the natural foods. 93 for veal liver. So here you have liver or cod liver oil, liver, 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 and more liver. And then if you look at the bottom, this is the I think this is the whole organ meat thing. You're going to have things like tripe uh, and, and lungs uh, that aren't quite as, uh, as interesting. So this is what it looks like when you initially plot it. And that's because these things are so damn nutritious that can go up to you know, 40 times or 35 times the RDA and vitamin A and then B12 and all that stuff. So if you focus in on the graph, this is what you get. Again, pretty nutritious. You know, the number one is right here. So you're looking at a good distribution, uh, a lot of uh, nutrient density in here. On the low end of things for the, the organ meats, I had to split that one in two. You've got a lot of lungs and tripe and uh, that kind of stuff, stomach. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is, you know, some of it is fairly low, but still respectable compared to, uh, to grains, for example, uh, in a decent distribution. Not so much in this category, though. Plant, fat, uh, plant fats and oils. I highlighted this one because people are going to complain that so this is going to increase your average score uh, in an unnatural way. It's not going to make that big of a difference. We'll see. This is all of the plant fats. Uh, at the top, you've got things like you know, wheat germ, uh, hazelnut, sunflower, canola oil. And then at the bottom, you've got things like coconut oil and avocado oil, mustard oil, and whatnot. So here's a sampling of that. And you know, fairly deficient on this end of things. A lot of vitamin E, a lot of vitamin K, a little bit of choline, and not much of anything else, really. So they, that's why they get a, a pretty poor score. Uh, so here's a sample data from animal fats and oils. Oh, so this is plant fats and oils, sorry. So here's a sample data from animal fats and oils. So a little bit uh, better in the distribution, I would say. Uh, this is for the, the pork, enhanced cob fat, uh, back fat, whatever that is. Sorry, this is the back fat. Uh, duck fat and then animal fat and all that stuff. Pretty good distribution. So now you take these things. You grab an average score for each category. And again, I tried to be fair and remove all the refined stuff from the categories. And this is what you get. Here's your average nutrient density score. Here's your category. Organ meats at the top, herbs and, herbs and spices, nuts and seeds, cacao, fish and seafood, pork, beef, eggs, dairy, vegetables, lamb, veal, poultry, legumes, is where, this is where they show up, processed meat, vegetables, plant fats and oils, fruit, animal skin, uh, grains and pseudo cereals that are cooked, refined and processed fats and oils, animal fats and oils, grains and processed fruit. Uh, the plant fats and oils without the wheat germ at minus 6.07, uh, 6 so they wouldn't have moved a whole lot. But now, if you introduce the raw grains and legumes, this is what you get. They actually come on top of all the meat except for the organ meats. This notion that grains and legumes are healthy for you comes from their consideration, from their analyses in the raw state, in a state in which they cannot be consumed. This does not belong here. This should not be considered. You cannot eat it in that state. Da doesn't go here. 
right? So you leave that out of the process. That is where this myth is coming from. And it's true, they have a lot of nutrients. You can't eat it that way. What's the point? You don't consider that. Finally, I think some of you are gonna be criticizing this and say, well, you know, that 100 grams, it contains water, it contains fiber, you know, so you're disfavoring the, the vegetables and the fruits, that's probably their low on the list. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna define something called the caloric weight, and I'm gonna take that 100 grams and I'm gonna subtract the mass of the water and the fiber from it. So foods that have a lot of water and that have a lot of fiber or both are now favored. What do you get? This is what you get. I now call this the caloric weight score. Organ meats, herbs and spices, nuts and seeds, nothing's changed. <laughs> the legumes come up, they have a lot of fiber. Then you get fish and seafood, pork, beef, cacao, lamb, poultry, plants, fats and oils, all that stuff. The refined uh, grains are, are still way over here, sorry. Doesn't make that much of a difference except for the legumes, really. If you wanna see them side by side, this is what they look like. This is the ranking according to nutrient density and this is using this, this caloric weight score. So if you guys wanna take pictures of that, I have to end, we're done. So conclusions, the available data suggests that a diet centered around meat, vegetables, fruits, nuts and seed is very nutrient dense and can easily provide all essential nutrients in adequate quantities. The notion that grains and legumes are nutrient dense likely originates from a lack of segregation between raw grains and legumes which are inedible uh, versus cooked grains and legumes. So these should not be part of the equation. Animal foods are highly ranked even though raw and cooked meat were not segregated and essential fatty acids, essential amino acids, vitamin B7, some minerals and bioavailability were not taken into account. So imagine that they're going to go even higher if we had all of this data. Uh, finally, some acknowledgements. Uh, my girlfriend for being very patient with me while I was uh, crunching all of this data. I had to cancel some arrangements, gotten a lot of heat for it. She was very patient, I love her. Ned Koch of Health Correlator, who helped me out with some of this data. He's like, dude, you need to process it this way and, and all that stuff, super useful. Amy Kubel, who pointed me in the direction of a lot of the nutrient uh, scoring systems. Chris Masterjohn and Stefan Guiné, who also helped me out and consulted with, uh, with some of the data processing, uh, as well as uh, Rob Wolf. So uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> So now we have a 15 minute break, but Matt Lalon loves questions. So it's up to you if you wanna come and ask. Hey, I'm Dave. My name is David. And I just wanted to raise two points. My first one is when you were talking about the sustainability of grains and legumes. I completely agree with you that, uh, you know, chemical fertilizers in the current way we do that, it's bad for the environment, but if we're, feed, if we're trying to feed a world of seven billion or eight billion and approach on nine billion people, you know, cereal grains are the only way we can match I know exactly where you're going, and the problem with that is one that no one wants to admit. It's overpopulation, I'm sorry. Nothing's gonna solve it, okay? I agree. What we but need I mean, to do is get, is get sustainable agriculture first, then figure out how many people we can support. Right? I agree, but so if we look at, if we look at, we can praise Joel Salatin all we want, and I really like what he does, but that relies on corn and soy. It's not sustainable. I agree. You got 50 years of topsoil left. What's your I solution? Agree. No, I agree. I will, if you look at permaculture approaches, like I'd encourage you to read Meat of Benign Extravagance. We don't have a lot of time. Next question. All right. And can I raise my second point? Sure. My second point is that, you know, it's really easy for you to say that, um, you know, it's just a myth that legumes are nutrient dense, but I feel like that's only half true. I completely agree with you that it's bad to look at it raw. But if I look at something like lentils, especially with correct preparations. Like I know Stephen, who, Stephen Guyane, who you referenced. I he, did show them with correct preparation at the end and their score did increase. Sorry, well, I, when I was looking at the graphs, I didn't see legumes at all, you didn't highlight that. But if I'm just, I'm just giving you one example of I did show legumes. I not only did I show legumes, toxins, raw legumes and cooked legumes, it's low I showed toxins, their score increasing death, and It's not end. very palatable. Next question. I just question. want to finish my question. Can I ask Next a question, question over here? Hi, yeah. Matt, uh, Todd Becker. So. Really nice analysis, I liked it. Uh, one minor point though, when you use the term nutrient and you're referring to essential nutrient, yes. the concept of an essential nutrient is something where you, you absolutely need a certain minimum, but the analysis doesn't say whether you actually need more than that or whether it's useful. For, no, so for example, minerals like selenium, can be uh, essential yeah. at a low amount, but can be toxic at a Exactly, high and that's something that you need to consider at the end. That's why I use the RDA, and when you see things that are like 30 times the RDA, that's telling you that that food's a little too much, that like you should have very little of it. 
right? So I'm not saying that that food is like the best food that you could possibly eat. So as far so. as how to use the index, it's mainly these are foods you should have at least a little of, but not to go crazy. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, and, and the people that advocate eating liver say just that. Yes. Hi. Uh, did you say in the beginning that you were going to make this database? Yeah, email me and I'll send it to you. Well, as a graduate student, I really appreciate that gesture. Um, you're, you're welcome. One of the people I consulted told me that the, what I just did was a PhD's worth of work. Right. Yeah, right. It took six days. Okay. My second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second thing I noticed in, in your data is that foods that were low on nutrients and calories, uh, especially in fruits, veggies, and seafood, they tend to be cheap. That's based on my experience. I might be wrong here. And foods that were nutriently dense, nutri nutri nutritionally dense, and calorically dense, tended to be costly. Some of them. Have you thought? Have you thought about factoring in cost per hundred grams into your analysis? That's great. If you could do that. If I could have the data, though, that's great. You know, the, I I use what I had at my disposal with this spreadsheet, but that's a great idea. I like that. Yeah, just a suggestion. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Uh, I had one remark also. You used the USDA database on nutrients? The USDA, yeah. Yeah, you said it. Yeah, so that data comes from the USDA. Yeah, I know, I know. And you said it didn't provide uh, information on essential fatty acids and vitamin D2 and D3. There is a more expanded database exactly. that does. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't use that one because it's an access. And I want to be able to give this, uh, this spreadsheet to other people. Most people don't have access, they have Excel. So I, I chose to go with really? Excel. Really? I used yeah. it in Excel. Really? The I access to the full version one? I don't know. I, I just downloaded the same with all the fatty acids, D3, D2, and D3, and oh, I well, used it in I'll Excel. I'll have to look at that. Yeah, it's a, a nice way to waste three days of my yeah, life cate recategorizing everything. Yeah. That's why I stood up. I wanted to make the people, they well, now they know it's also accessible in Excel, so everybody can do it, I think. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. Question about uh, the meat. Yep. Now, the meat you presented, that's all, is that all grain-fed meat? So there was only one entry for grass-fed meat, and it was a raw cut, so I was not able to uh, cover it and compare it to anything So the, else. Difference, the numbers would be were even all better grain. if you had actually grass-fed. Uh, and if you consider the essential fatty acids, yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. So the person said, for the record, most lamb is grass-fed and not in general, yes. Good news, folks. There are oysters on every corner in this, uh, That's in this city. In this yeah. uh, little town, and it, they all taste great. Uh, small question. Um, I don't know if you, you came into this, but would it make your table um, more interesting if you merged it with the glycemic load for uh, nutrients? Oh, you're not talking to Or that are we talking here about 30 days? You can do that. I'll give you the, the template. I'll give you my fax number. Okay. And, uh, yeah. I see. I see why you use the RDAs, but do you have a lot of confidence when they don't consider like the vi different vitamin Ks or? It's you know it's the it's the best I had. So yes, the the RDAs are are not always right. Uh, like the RDA for calcium set a little bit too high because they think that calcium is going to solve all our osteoporosis problems, and then for others it's set low. So it's really it's not that great. But you notice that a lot of the foods went above the RDA. So. No, but it's, it, again, I work with what I have, so I, I agree, um, but that's, in the DRI, that's what I have. Is there a way to weight the importance of certain ones that you think people generally are lacking, so, you know? So, so that's another thing, like, but if you start doing that, then you start biasing it a little bit, so what would be in interesting is just, listen, the data's there, if you know you're lacking something, then go find the foods, you can order them by which one has the most vitamin E, which one has the most of this fairly easily, but that would be most useful if it came with bioavailability. No problem. Um, so you a couple times said that if you had access or if you had included the essential fatty acids as well, that it would change, you know, it would make meats better, but actually if you consider that the essential ones, as you mentioned, are linolenic and linoleic, which are higher the in things like soy. The accepted essential ones, what I mean is the, the real essential ones, which are DHA and arachidonic acid. Yeah, okay, so Docosa hexaenoic acid, try saying that seven times fast, and arachidonic acid. Yeah. So, but if, if you're going with the guidelines that are currently set up, it would be ALA and A, well, yeah, Bush would have the unfortunate 
uh, you know, it gives soybean oil and all yes, these oils no. a really high thing. And that's, that's not what I'm thinking about, no. And just kind of as a secondary to that, things like that and also maybe potentially selenium that are potentially, when they become too nutrient dense, are problematic? Is there any Yes, way? yeah, we just talked about that. Like, you know, if Brazil nuts give you 30 times the RDA and selenium, don't have a, a lot of them on a, on a daily basis. I'm not saying that you have to eat all the time at the top of the food chain. It's just like try going from moderate to high and, and using that to guide your, uh, your proportions. Um, in the realm of foods that you eat, which food surprised you the most? Fruit. In fact, the reason why I went to this uh, model where I took out the water and I, uh, I took out the, the fiber, or I accounted for water and fibers, because I was like, how can fruit be so low? And I just started putting more fruit in my diet. I'm like, are you kidding me? So but are you going yeah. to take it back out now? It, well, I don't know. I I'm, I'm seem to be doing well with more fruit, but I was really surprised. Yeah, that's a good question. Hey, Matt, just over here. It's all sugar, uh, yeah. Bless you. Matt, just to be clear, you were, you were working with what you had and not... We still have some other intuitive or, oh. yeah, so for example, you know, it's weird that a, that a wild boar is, is not stacking up against an industrial yeah. pig, so right? You, re you remind me of something too. Um, there is data missing in the spreadsheet. When you open up, there are places where there's absolutely no data. And I had to treat that as zero. So, you know, that data needs to be. Uh, I saw some folks furiously scribbling down this, like this was going to be their dietary guideline from now on. That wasn't exactly your point. This is just one perspective. Exactly. And if you looked at the, the, the animal, the organ meats and oils, cod, uh, no, sorry, in the animal fats, fish oil had zero across the line. It had nothing on it. I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, not even a little vitamin E as a stabilizer. Yeah. So there was something wrong there with that. Sorry for taking up so much time.